Welcome to the Damcasters. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Welcome to part two of our conversation with aerospace engineer Joe Welding. And apologies for my voice in the intro. I'm not well, but we're going to get through this. Bear with me, please, people. So as this episode drops on the day after the final ever Boeing 747 rolled off the assembly lines at the Everett plant, the final leg of the operation of one of the most iconic aircraft in history has begun. The airliners of Boeing, McDonnell Douglas and Airbus have become so familiar to us, they're almost mundane. But with those changes in power source that we discussed last week, will come a change in shape. So what is the shape of the future? So Joe and I get into that this week. But first, there is one important power source we didn't cover last week that we get into first. And that is the dream of the arch hawk Curtis LeMay, the nuclear option, the aircraft that never has to land. I like that you threw nuclear into this list yep. because we all have those memories of those nuclear powered bombers from the 50s that they, <laughs> Curtis LeMay's dream of having a bomber that never had to land. Um, I also like, ladies and gentlemen, the first bullet point on this says, don't really want to waste time on this. I really do, because this I think we could have a lot of fun here. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. So nuclear powered aircraft, Joe, go. What 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 would be amazing about that? Well, the amazing thing is it, it would essentially be the equivalent of a of a nuclear powered submarine, right? Which can basically stay submerged until your food runs out. Uh, that, that's the real limiting uh, factor on a on a nuclear powered submarine. So theoretically, the same thing could be built in an airplane where you could literally built an airplane that could orbit the earth, not orbit from a space standpoint, but at, you know, whatever else do for months, you know, in, in essentially how much food you could, you could bring along or how long before the pilot's legs give out and he's feeling cramped in his seat. So, so that's the plus, you know, and, and obviously you would have to be up for months at a time, but you could build an airliner that you refuel once a year, or once every couple of years where you're just flying airport to airport and you just keep going because all your fuel's on board. So, so that's the upside. Uh, of course, the downside is, is you're flying around with a, a nuclear reactor on your airplane, which has two problems. Um, you know, one is the, oh, the no, shielding. Of the only two. <laughs> only two. Yeah. You have the shielding on the airplane itself. So, you know, you've got passengers and pilots in close proximity to a nuclear reactor. And on a submarine, you know, this is solved by massive shielding of lead and probably other materials that you can afford the weight of on an airplane or a submarine, but hard to do on an airplane. And then the second one is the crash worthiness, right? Like, you know, we've all heard the horror stories and witnessed horror stories of nuclear power plants that have a meltdown or a, or an accident with a, a earthquake or whatever. And you just start putting that on airplanes and that's going to be a, a regular event and you can't control where an airplane crashes, right? So at least a power plant, you can put it in an area that doesn't have a lot of population right next door and so forth, but a airplane, you don't, you don't get that luxury. So, so yeah, um, man, I, I actually, I'm a huge fan of nuclear power in general. I always have been. And, and, um, I would so, as an airplane purist and airplane designer, I would so love to go explore this because it would just open up so much possibility on what <laughs> what could be done. But I also am a realist that I understand the limitations. Um, the one thing I will say about nuclear is, and this is a personal opinion, not everyone's going to agree with me on this. I think it is the best answer for uh, solving the secondary problem of any alternate energy source in airplanes is where does that energy ultimately come from? You know, so whether it's charging batteries or generating hydrogen or generating sustainable aviation fuels, all of three of those are energy intensive uh, uh, sources of, 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 of a problem to be solved. And you, that base energy has to come from somewhere. And it's very convenient to say, oh, let's use renewables. Well, again, renewables right now in, on the planet are, I don't remember, something 10 or 15% of all of our power. Not everybody can use that answer, right? Somewhere this energy has to come from. And I'm a big proponent of nuclear. So secondarily, I think we should have nuclear powered airplanes, but um, maybe just not on board. <laughs> and if we could get cold fusion, that's a whole different oh, thing to talk yes. about. But... That, that's, that's the future. <laughs> and I, I think yeah. that's that's a huge point that I, I've, you know, I've just come back from a business trip in Australia. We've had a huge energy show where the majority of solar re renewables and things like that there's there's an exciting shift 
and a lot of time, effort, money being put into making that sort of transition of using renewable fuels for things like this, cars, transportation, and a lot, but minimizing that generation factor, which, yeah, you're sort of robbing Peter to pay Paul at the moment, but it's, it, it's, it, it's minimizing that initial um, cost to the matter. And yeah, mm-hmm. I, I kind of agree with you really. I think nuclear done properly is the best, the best option we have at the moment. Um, right. Again, just expensive to get going. And today, who who wants to who wants to spend money? Um, but what about a combination of these things? What if yeah, we we start saying, all right, mm-hmm. well, we may not be able to go whole hog in one direction. But what about say good old good old jet fuel and a jet engine to get us up? Something else to keep us there um, yep. because that's you know, you don't need as much power once you're at altitude, all of that sort of thing. So how would a, a hybrid of, of di- various versions of these technologies play into it? Or, or is that not viable in itself? No, it's it's absolutely viable. And, and in all likelihood, whatever you first see start to become mainstream on any of these topics probably will be some version of a, of a hybrid. So it's, it's taking some pros and some cons, unfortunately, but from all of these and kind of mixing them together. So the, I guess we haven't really talked about this, but the first thing to talk about is, is okay, all this sounds plausible. You know, why, why hasn't any of these ideas really taken off yet? And it really comes down to range. And, it, and it's all a function of this weight problem um, and somewhat volume as well if you're on hydrogen, but it's mostly a weight problem. Um, so any airplane, like you can make a, a electric airplane or a, or a hydrogen powered airplane. They have been, like there's been a lot of demonstrators over the last couple of years. There's even at least one I know of, I think there's just one, but the Pipistrol um, is a little two seat trainer, uh, all electric battery powered that actually is certified. You can go buy it today and 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 you can go buy it, you can go fly it. Like this is a thing, <laughs> this does exist today in small numbers. Uh, but that airplane, um, as much as I love it, it has a flight time of like 50 minutes and you can fly like, I don't know, 150 kilometers in it or something like that. Um, and that's it. And and so that's the real problem with any of these technologies. If you try to build them purely as that mode of energy right now, if the airplane looks something like a conventional airplane, it looks like a modern airliner or whatever, you're probably going to be limited to something like three or 400 kilometers range. Um, you know, which is not much. Um, that said, there is a market for those type airplanes, especially training aircraft and even regional uh, small transport, you know, hub and spoke kind of type airplanes. There's a lot of airline flights you can go get on today that are less than three or 400 kilometers. So, so that's doable. Um, if you change the airplane a little, make the airplane a little more efficient, you can get more, like probably 500, 700, maybe a thousand kilometers is probably doable with everything we just talked about in today's technology, or maybe call it within a year or two as a few things resolve, but with a different looking airplane. So you're talking about a higher wingspan, higher efficiency, probably a lower base weight that you're going to trade off some durability for, maybe maintainability, something like that. But that's probably doable. Still a far cry from a modern airliner that'll fly, you know, what, 10,000 kilometers or something like that, but but still a product that fits a niche. And and I think that's what a lot of companies are going for right now is how do we start this on a path that's more sustainable? Well, let's get a foothold somewhere and then let's, let's expand from there. And so that brings us back to hybrids. So hybrids can basically start with that starting point of something you know, low hundreds of kilometers of range to maybe mid, you know, 500, mid, you know, sub 1000. And let's make it even a little bit better. And so with hybrid, there's a couple of ways of doing it. Um, so one of the problems with all airplanes, but this is very much true of these, these new energy airplanes, um, is you have to have reserve, uh, reserves on an airplane. So it's not just I could be able to fly across the Atlantic. I could be able to fly across the Atlantic. And then if I had higher headwinds, I need to make sure I have extra fuel on board to, to make sure that I make it across the Atlantic. Um, and, and then there's also, what if I make it across the Atlantic and all of a sudden there's a thunderstorm over Heathrow and I need to divert to somewhere else, right? Like 100 miles away or 100 kilometers away. So you also have that, that extra fuel for that as well. And the way those are written, what the, the alternate is usually written in a distance. The, the reserves is usually written in a time. And if you have an airplane that only flies for 45 minutes, the reserve might be 45 minutes. <laughs> so the penalty you have to carry a reserve is massive. Whereas if you have an airplane that flies for 10 hours, 
45 minutes is like, who cares, right? Like, yeah, we'll put that extra fuel on. But if you're flying for 45 minutes initially, that's like, okay, I got to carry double my fuel now. So one of the things a lot of people are talking about is a backup energy source that's not normally used. So you can still claim your airplane is carbon free or green or whatever, but it's got like a fossil fuel generator on board of some sort, like an APU that then basically powers in that emergency mode. In that case, you're polluting, but that's going to be like one out of a hundred flights you ever fire that thing up and actually use it. So that's a version of hybrid. Um, that's kind of the best possible version if you're trying to go for real sustainability because you, you virtually never use it. Another version is what you were just talking about. You, you know, there's, there's different energy needs to different phases of flight. Take off and climb for most airplanes is the, the critical one. And then once you get up to cruising, you throttle back and you're burning a lot less fuel. So maybe you have a hybrid system that is using fossil fuels potentially to create that energy for that very short phase of flight, take off and climb. And then you shut that source down and then sustain the rest of the flight on 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 um, your battery power, your fuel cell or hydrogen or whatever. Um, another version is you have an airplane that maybe has 1,000, 2,000 kilometers of range. And to get to that full range, you need to supplement part of the flight with fossil fuels. But on other flights that are short, you never have to do that. So then you have an airplane that's like three quarters of green or something like that. And for a whole lot of flights, you can say it's zero emission, but on those very long legs, just to make it work, you have to use some. So that's that's another way. Um, and then there's one final one that um, some people are working on, and that is uh, putting basically features into a modern jet engine to make it more efficient. So a jet engine is just like we've talked about differences between takeoff and climb and cruise. A jet engine, if you were going to design a, a, a highly efficient jet engine for each of those phases of flight, it would look very different. And so all jet engines end up being a compromise to like work in all of those and have some balance of efficiency. So theoretically, if you put some extra energy into the engine, like with an electric motor, you could supplement that that uh, engine at the phase of flight that you really need a lot of, of thrust, but then it's really optimized with that motor turned off for your like your cruise condition or wherever you need more efficiency. So that's another way of doing this that brings the overall efficiency of the airplane down, but it still is relying on fossil fuels as its primary driver. So, so all of these move in the right direction, but they're not really able to totally solve the problem. But, but because they make a more practical airplane, I do believe whatever hits market first in a, in a mainstream way will probably have some version of hybrid built into it for reserves, if nothing else. So it's that incremental journey while, you know, the, the harder problems are figured out, we can use what we know and what we can get our hands on at the moment to start trying to keep that 5% at a reasonable, reasonable level when it comes to emissions. I, I, th I think that um, your idea there of having a backup your diversion engine essentially being run on uh, on on fossils is 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 a really interesting idea because yeah from the good old days of flight planning when the weather is bad especially here in, in the south of England as soon as you've got fog your your diversion goes from from Heathrow to Gatwick to Heathrow to Manchester and that can throw out lots lots of um, well ladies and gentlemen when your bags don't make it on a flight. It's usually a guy like me who's gone, we'll leave him behind so we can get in case we have to divert. And I think that's that's really interesting that if if you know you, you do your flight planning on on your say your electric engines, but then you can have the safety of being able to do that little bit of a longer divert on, on carbon. And of course then that makes the trading aspect of, of that carbon credit a little bit more flexible. Right. Yeah. The other thing I really like about the hybrid idea is it it has the best chance of actually just getting something into the market. So, you know, a lot of people like to think about this in very uh, kind of almost extreme terms of if we're going to do this, let's go, you know, fully carbon free, which is a great goal to have. However, if, if that limits what you can do and actually is the barrier to entry, then why not go for half of that and just get something moving, right? And if, because the other part of all of this, everything we talked about, whether it's batteries or, or hydrogen tanks or, or fuel cells, none of that's been, I shouldn't say none, but in the way it's being proposed, hasn't really been certified before, you know, by the regulators. So like, what are the safety implications? What are the maintenance requirements? What are the crash worthiness requirements? All of that kind of stuff and all of this needs to be figured out. And it will be, none of that's going to prevent this from happening. But the sooner we can start as an industry moving in that direction and getting those answers solved, the better. That way, as all of this evolves, as batteries get better or whatever technology it is, fuel cells, hydrogen tanks, whatever, 
all of that stuff is already in work. And so all this, you know, better technology can just kind of dovetail in and just all of these airplanes just keep getting better with time. And if hybrid is the way that that door first gets cracked open, in my opinion, that's like, so be it, you know, let's, let's go down that path and start making this happen. So we spent most of this conversation talking about something that nobody really ever sees, which is the, the fuel source. But the other big change of this is aircraft that we know now are based around uh, the aerodynamics, the way they look, the shapes that we're used to is, is basically because of the, of the way they're powered. When we start moving into these alternate, I don't want to say alternate power sources, but it, for argument's sake, let's call it that. What effect is that going to have on the airframe itself? Because just just from my my watching of the world, there's some funky looking designs coming out with with, with with these sorts of things. So what what's that noticeable thing? People, everybody can draw an airplane now, but can they draw what an airplane potentially is going to be with with a different power source and a different fuel source? Yeah, and and I don't think there's a standard answer on this. And obviously, if you look at, I think there's something like twenty or more companies right now working on some sort of uh, alternate, uh, alternately powered airplane, kind of in the the bigger space, you know, personal aircraft or or bigger commuter or whatever. Um, and they all look different, right? Some of them are literally taking an existing airplane and retrofitting a fuel cell and some electric motors into it but they're literally just taking an airplane that's already built and certified and and adapting it and and some people are doing from a demonstrator standpoint some some companies are actually proposing to do that as a certifiable product you could go buy a ticket on and and in some ways i'm like man more power to them if they can do that quickly and cut the whole airplane development cycle and get something moving here i'd love it. harbor air's e-beaver out in vancouver per perfect example yep Yep. And then another one is um, uh, Wright, uh, I forget, Wright Electric Airplane Company, I think what they call themselves, um, is taking uh, BAE 146s, which is an older four-engine jet from the, I don't know, 80s, I guess. The old, whisp the old and, whisper and, jet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And retrofitting that, um, or proposing to retrofit that with with an electric power system. Great idea. Um, the problem is, is that airplane obviously was designed as a jet, <laughs> right, with fossil fuels. So just... Putting and I think if I remember right, they're going the hydrogen um, uh, fuel cell route. I think um, so. Just retrofitting that, you're it's going to work, but it's not going to be the ultimate design, right? It's going to have real very short range, which is fine. Like I think they've got a business model that, that works for. But if you want to get to an airplane like we were talking about that gets up above like 500 kilometers, you know, pushing a thousand kilometers, the airplane has to be more efficient than what a current airliner um, is. And there's a couple ways to do that. The, the two big drivers on a, on a not supersonic airplane are uh, uh, induced drag and, and parasite drag. And so one, the parasite drag is a function of surface area and kind of shape. You know, if you have a nice streamlined shape, a lot of, not a lot of antennas and crap hanging out, you'll have low parasite drag. And induced drag is a function of wingspan um, and weight. But as you scale, you need more wingspan. So most of the higher efficiency, higher range airplanes you're going to see are going to have very long wingspans, um, look more like a sailplane wing than a, than a traditional airplane. Probably we're going to have a strut braced wing. So think like a, a Cessna, you know, that has a, a structural member underneath the wing um, and probably a high wing in that case. Um, and that what that does is that makes a much more weight efficient, very high uh, wingspan or high aspect ratio wing. You don't have to do that. But I think in general, what you'll find is that ends up being a pretty good trade if you're trying to do a, a long wingspan airplane that is relatively heavily loaded, like a like one of these. And, and I guess that plays back into our infrastructure conversation from earlier, which is yes. you, airports are designed to, to take at, at their outside the largest aircraft that we have now. But if you're having something that's shorter, but a lot wider, that again, changes changes quite significantly the way an airport is laid out just for getting people onto an aircraft, for example. Yeah, that's exactly right. And near term, you're obviously not going to go redesign all your airports, right? It's not going to happen. <laughs> Over time, it could, but not no time soon. Given how long um, I know it takes some major airports to make any decisions, that's probably, it. That's probably yeah, or, a good thing. Or, or, or an airport even just to add like two gates sometimes feels like it <laughs> <laughs> takes a decade. And, and yeah, anyway. So... If you're talking about a small airplane, something, you know, 10, 15, 20 seats or whatever, you want a higher wingspan than what a, a traditional uh, uh, 10 or 15 seat airplane would have. However, 
it probably not that much longer. Probably if you increase the wingspan 20 or 30%, that would be enough to make a good efficient airplane of that size. And then you're kind of creeping into the next class of airplanes. So think like a, a 20 or 30 seat commuter turboprop, which doesn't really exist anymore from an operational standpoint, but um, then creeping into the, the footprint of like a 50 or 60 seat turboprop, right? So that might be okay at an airport because obviously they can deal with those bigger airport or airplanes whether they have enough gates and enough, you know, parking ramp space or whatever is questionable, but it's it could happen. So getting into was probably dash, not dash possible. Sort of size. Yeah, yeah. What's probably not possible is if you want to build like a fifty or hundred seat airplane that now has the same wingspan as like a triple <laughs> seven. Yes, that space does exist on an airport, but most airports have enough gates for like a few of those airplanes, not you know, dozens or, or hundreds. And so, and, and your little 50 seat commuter jet is not going to get a wide body gate. I'm sorry. It's just not. No. So, so that's probably a non-starter, um, which means either that bigger airplane, you need to limit the wingspan on, which is going to have an efficiency problem, or you need to get creative and think about folding wing tips or something like that, which um, is doable. You know, the, the, the new version of the 777, the 777 X has folding wing tips there for the same reason. Like they, they're actually on the same route. They extended the wingspan to make that airplane more efficient. And they figure out, wait a second, we're already at our limit from a gate exposed full wingtip. So that's in the process of being certified. It's not certified yet, but it will be. Um, but that's a very modest, I think their wingtip is, I don't know, 10 feet or something. And we're probably talking two or three times that of what I'm talking about, you know, to make it practical or make it big enough to have an effect that you need. So um, anyway, there's some challenges there. That also adds weight, weight's the other killer on this. It's not just drag. So I don't know where that's going to end up. Um, I'm sure there's a bunch of companies working on that, but, um, but yeah, there's, it, it's interesting how all of these things are always in conflict, right? You've got the things that you want to do as an airplane designer, as a purist, stuff like, oh my gosh, yeah, I want this amazing wing. And then you look at, yeah, but I can't service that at an airport. So, <laughs> um, yeah, realities creep in. So, it, so, it, you know, all aircraft design is compromise. And I suppose th at the moment we're looking at the, the ultimate compromises to, to get um, the form factor and the weight factor into an area that is, that is viable. Um, you, you've got it, you've got it there that, you know, passenger experience is going to come into this as well. Um, I, I remember the conversations years ago, I think when the set travel seven and seven, eight were, were being designed that they were going to get rid of windows and just have video screens and things like that to, to ease of manufacture. But at the end of the day, you want to put passengers in it. They have certain um, expectations, he says, making air quotes. Um, so that you, your limiting factors come down to human elements plus the aerodynamic ones as well. How, how does that start sort of playing into what these aircraft are going to have to be? Because could, could you sell it as this is a highly efficient green aircraft, but you're going to have to sort of sit in something without windows, for example? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I don't, I certainly don't have an answer on this. I don't think anybody does. Um, I think it's going to take a lot of market research and probably some companies trying some little things and seeing how they, how the market responds, right? Like if you ask any passenger, just do a survey, would you be okay without windows on an airplane? Most of them are going to say no, right? <laughs> but, but a question like that is not well posed either because it's like, it's like in change for what? Right. Like if you just ask that, it's like, well, no, I want a window. Um, but if you say, but it, it, it enables the airplane being completely carbon free, some people would actually highly value that and say, like, yes, of course. Other people wouldn't. Right. And, and people who like aisle seats, they don't care. They're, they're a strange bunch. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And then, yeah, some people actually today with no trade off would be like, well, I don't care. I sit in an aisle seat. I never look out the window. Who cares? <laughs> you know, I'm not in that camp. But, uh, <laughs> I that's part of the joy of flying is looking out the window, right? <laughs> exactly. But anyway, personal preference. Um, yeah. So, so, I mean, a window is just one example. Another example is, uh, you know, personal space, like how, how big is the seat? Like I've seen uh, at a, at a interior trade show a couple of years ago, I saw a proposed idea where you didn't even have a seat. You had this like thing you were leaning against and kind of squatting almost and with a seat belt. So it was safe and it was certifiable, but holy cow, did it look terrible. Ryanair every few years put something out saying, oh, we're going to do those standy uppy things. So just to gauge what the reaction's going to be. And it's, it's a weird world. The, the one nice thing about the way these type of airplanes are going to start is they're going to be short flights just by the definition of it. And so I think probably passengers are willing to give up some things if you say, okay, you're only going to be on this airplane for 
you know, 45 minutes or something like that. So, so that definitely aligns, you know, if you're doing a long haul over the ocean, you probably have a lot more sensitivity to how nice the, the, the creature comforts on the airplane are. Um, same applies to drinks and food and stuff like that. You know, like catering on an airplane is not an insignificant amount of weight. Um, like, do you really, if you're on an airplane in 45 minutes, do you really need to be served a drink? Um, you don't get that on a, on a train or on a, you know, express to the airport. If there's so, not a gin and tonic on board, Joe, I'm not getting on. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So anyway, but to your original point, I think there's a lot of questions that need to be questioned on this. If we're going after efficiency in every way, where, where, where is the line, you know, on what passengers will accept in, in trade-off for a more efficient and a more sustainable airplane? What would be some of the other, the main sort of visual aspects that would be striking? Because I, I guess that there's, for most passengers, there's something reassuring about seeing a familiar shape out at, at the end of the gate because they're in their mind if they think safe but you know you in 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 the notes you've sent over you've got um the yes, aspect tailless aircraft things like that what are, are we really thinking of major major changes to just the aesthetic shape of of, of an aircraft to go forward some companies certainly are um and i, I don't know i my my money is not on seeing anything completely radical anytime soon as far as actually getting certified and getting into the mainstream. Um, I'm not opposed to any of those ideas. You know, like I'm actually a huge fan of flying wings. I think flying wings are amazing, but there's a lot of compromises with them. And and especially on a, on a, on a, a transport category aircraft, you know, it's the shape of the fuselage is one. It's, it's, you probably don't have windows in a, in a flying wing. You can theoretically depending on the shape and the layout, but it's hard. Um, the, the weight and balance on a, on a flying wing is really hard because you don't have a tail that can make up for a lot of CG range, um, variability. So how you load the airplane full versus empty and with and without bags and so forth is challenging on a flying wing. Um, not, not impossible to solve, but it's, but it's hard. Um, and so and, and that's just one example, right? So like you get rid of the tail on an airplane, the tail is probably 10% to both tails, vertical and, and horizontal, probably 10% of the weight of the airplane, probably 10% of the drag. You know, that's a pretty big number is just say, well, get rid of it, um, both on weight and drag. Like that's pretty appealing. And if you can say, same with the fuselage, just blend it into the wing, like sounds awesome, but it comes with a lot of constraints. So I don't think we're going to see flying wing, total flying wing certified airplane anytime soon, but it could be. And there's other ideas, like there's ideas like you do the, like the blended wing, like biplane kind of thing where you've got an upper wing and a lower wing and they kind of morph together in a wingtip. Like there's some theoretical advantages to stuff like that. Um, there's some structural and weight and sometimes drag if there's high interference drag. And so like none of these answers are perfect, but there's a lot of people throwing out ideas on all that kind of stuff that has promised. But again, in my experience, the aviation industry hates change. Is the, the 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 final answer hates change. The visionaries love change, right? And that's why you see all these ideas, some crazy, some not crazy. But getting that through to the end in a practical sense, when you factor in all the other stuff, not just purely the aerodynamics or the efficiency, but like the passenger experience, the airport infrastructure experience, the certification, all of that always tends to shoot ideas like this down. And so that's why just as a realist, I'm skeptical you're going to see any radically different ideas actually get through the end zone anytime soon. I don't like that answer, but uh, that is my answer. <laughs> well, you know, you're absolutely right. It, it is a remarkably conservative industry and the excuse for that is always, is always safety, but it's, you know, change, change is scary and yeah. change in the aviation world is terrifying to most. And I, I suppose maybe, you know, wanting to be optimistic here that, this drive towards a greener a greener future will allow some of the more weird and wacky um designs to to, to make their way through if there's a tangible benefit towards um reducing r reducing the footprint um i yeah we, we could i could be picking loads of these things out for it. I, I think that you know single pilot operations things like that that's very interesting um Cut, cutting down on crew to, you know, to, to alleviate weight. Um, all, all of that sort of stuff is a fascinating thing, but let's, let's, I suppose that the bit, the next bit we need to talk about really is 
and I, I love that you put it in here because I was going to raise this, the Jetsons effect. Mm -hmm. Now, for, for the, those of us of a certain age, there was a cartoon series called The Jetsons, which is the Space Age family that I think was something stupid that was set like 10 years ago in, 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 in the past. But they, they had cars that sort of flying cars that parked mm -hmm. next to things. Are we talking about getting nearly to a Jetson sort of world? Because I remember the the, the Uber um, helicopter sort of thing in, in Dubai, and there's terrifying looking e taxi things with those whirly blades of death um, spinning around. Are, is is that something that is viable now that we should be preparing ourselves for? That these the the the, the internals in, what do, what do they call them the um, I don't know it's EV toll, but the um these weird taxi services that you keep seeing people say that they've got yeah you know, second round of funding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, which we both can't remember the name exactly. for. It. But is, are, 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 are are we finally gonna be Judy Jetsons is 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 the question. Uh, my I, I mean I this is crystal ball. First of all, this is an area of, of aviation I've spent very little time in other than just as an observer. But um, and I've got some friends and colleagues that are very active in this space. So I know a little bit about it, but it's not something I've professionally been involved in hardly at all. Um so this is kind of just my outside observations and crystal ball stuff. So I, it's it's kind of like any of this stuff. I'm gonna say like kind of. <laughs> um I I do think we are closer to having the Jetson experience than we ever have. And literally people have been trying to crack this nut for probably close to a hundred years. You know, you can go, you know, it used to always be called flying cars, right? Like that that used to be. And this that's kind of still is used, but I would say less so. Um it but that was like the 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 fill in for uh, an airplane that had the practicality of a car, but also would fly, you know, and maybe it was a car, maybe you could drive it on the road, but if nothing else, you could keep it in your garage, you could probably fly it off of your driveway or your backyard or whatever, right? And so literally there's been ideas of this going on for like at least 80 years and probably more, and none of them have ever been practical. I think we are closer to that today than we've ever been in the past, like by a factor of 10, right? So the, and and to me, what what has, what has enabled that finally is, and I'll get to the cons here in a second, <laughs> but but like selling the dream here for just a second. I think what's really what has enabled that is a, electric propulsion and specifically the electric control systems. So, you know, you can go down to your toy store and buy your little radio controlled quadcopter and it, and it and it flies and it's great. And it's got an autopilot on board and someone got GPS on board. And it's like the state of technology in that little device is just mind blowing. In fact, you can go buy one for, you know, $20 or whatever. It's just, or more, but, but it's, it's mind boggling. Literally, the exact same technology that's in that little toy can be applied to a vehicle that you can go fly in. And that's exactly what companies are working on. And I think there's north of 300 companies across the world that are trying to do this right now. Um, some of them have never flown and never will, but a bunch of them have. And so this technology does work. This this is real. Um, and, and in a way that I've never seen before on, on this idea of having something that is is more like a car than it is like an airplane as far as take off anywhere, not a lot of footprint, you know, to store it and, and so forth. That said, it's got a whole lot of challenges. The, the, the biggest one, I guess, is it all really comes down to safety, um, safety and, and practicality a little bit. So all the things we talked about on an electric airplane, a conventional airplane also apply. So batteries are heavy, batteries take up space, they don't have a lot of power. So like the 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 um, electric uh, multi-copters, I'll, I'll call them for lack of a better term, and there's a lot of ways to describe this space. Um, what I've been told is they take like over 50% of their battery power just to get off the ground. So literally in the first like 10 or 20 seconds of flight, half your battery's gone. And so if that's the case, then you need a bunch more to land. Like you're not going to go very far in one of these. And if it's a pure um, multi-copter, no aerodynamic surfaces, your range is really limited. You know, maybe 10, 20 kilometers, something like that with current state of the art and trying to hold at least one human, if not more and so forth. Um, that said, there's a business model for that, right? Like how many city centers are 10 or 20 kilometers from the major airport? And like, that would be just fine to go get to the airport or go get outside the city, you know, to your country home or whatever. So I do think there's a market for that short range. I would say all of the companies that are working on one with even a little bit more range, call it 50 to 100 kilometers, have some sort of aerodynamic surfaces. So once they take off vertically, they're now in airplane mode. You know, so they've got a wing that's producing lift, which is a way more efficient way to fly than with, with rotors. 
um, those can get up into the 150, 100 kilometer, maybe a little more range. So that's a more practical way of doing it. Problem with those is now they're harder to build, there's structure there, um, there's aerodynamic control surfaces, it weighs more, like it just becomes more expensive. It takes up more space. You have wings, you, it's not this tiny little package. So with everything, like you said earlier, it's compromise, there's, there's trade-offs. So, um, and then, yeah, so that's kind of the the, the practical building and, and, and um, kind of size problems with these. They're not going to be cheap. You know, the batteries, the motors, the control systems, whatever, like going and thinking you can buy one of these for 10 or $20,000 or pounds or whatever, euros, whatever, is, is probably never going to happen, right? These are always going to be, ex at least in the near term, expensive vehicles. That's going to be more like a luxury sports car than it is a, something that an everyday person's ever going to be able to afford. Maybe we'll get there in time. I'm, I'm skeptical, but anyway. So I think it's always going to be a little bit like a helicopter is today. Yes, they exist. Yes, they're certified. Yes, you can go take a flight on one, but you probably can't afford to do that regularly unless you're high net worth or whatever. I think that's the near term. Maybe that'll change in time, but, and then, so, so these are built, they do work. Um, the one thing I, I don't know if this stat, uh, um, stat is correct or not, but there have been some accidents with these. I don't know how many have flown to date, but dozens at least, if not more. I don't think there's been a serious accident that you know, certainly that's caused the fatality of any of these. Uh, and somebody could correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I've not been able to find evidence of that, which to me is pretty remarkable. And A, it's a sign that this industry is taking this product and this problem seriously. You look at any other development of anything in the history of aviation or automotive or space or anything, and people are always dying in the early stages of it, anything that's high performance and pushing the boundaries. So the fact that this industry has a good safety record on this, if not perfect at this point, is remarkable. And I think that is actually a good testament to this technology is real and this actually does work. That said, flying some demo flights and some test flights in a very controlled environment, probably with a test pilot is very different than a certified product that is out in the mainstream and has everyday pilots or even no pilots, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, flying them. So there, there's a there's a big gap there that still exists. I think that gap is solvable, but it's going to take a lot more effort. So, you know, the regulatory bodies don't really know how to certify this. There's a lot of them and, and the companies working on that. They'll get through it, but that's a slow process. I think it's years away before this gets certified in the same way that airplanes do, where it's a very uh, simple and, 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 and a straightforward way to get through it in a, in a known amount of time. Um, and there's, there's, there's problems with the, the, the operational aspects and the physics of it as well. So like transitioning between hover and forward flight seems easy and your little quad copter you can buy at the toy store makes it look easy. The reality is at full scale, it's not easy. Some companies have solved it for sure, but it's that's one of the barriers. Like solving that problem is actually really hard and getting that to where it does that well in gusts and around buildings and stuff. Like I think there's a lot of unproven space there that's not done yet. And then the other big one is airspace, right? Like if, if you have one or two of these occasionally, like, you know, who cares? It's treat it like a helicopter and it's all fine. But if you actually get to where this is pretty mainstream, kind of like an Uber or a Lyft, where you're actually taking one to the airport and a city has a couple hundred of these, we don't have the air control infrastructure anywhere in the world to handle that right now. Totally solvable, but it's kind of like back to airport infrastructure. How do you piece those things together and how does that work? Um, and who pays for it and, and all of that. So... So yeah, I'm pretty excited about it myself. I, and I think it is coming, but I don't think it's going to be here tomorrow. And I think it's going to come in very slowly um, for all the reasons I just gave. Yeah, I, I think that environmental aspect is, is, is going to be fascinating because the in, just the environment of a built up area has a very different nature about it. You know, you, you, walk, you walk down the, the street with a bunch of high rises in it, you're walking into wind almost in every direction you're going to do. So you're going to have to have an aircraft that can yep. cope with quite sudden, very high gust environment that, you know, you can be looking at it and not just a sort of a, a, a lateral, um, lateral thing when you're taking off, but also in a, in a vertical space as well, which is, which is, which is right. fascinating. And then of course, noise as well, which you, you touched on as well. These noise things, is yeah. another big one. That, and, um, yep. You know, you just think how, how much people hate helicopters taking off and landing in places. Yeah, yeah. these things are much higher pitch, much more sustained. It's it, yeah, I think it's I think it's really cool. I, I think the yeah for, for for someone who's been waiting for this their their whole life and yeah yeah we all we all want to be the Jetsons. I I I'm, I'm with you. I think it, I think it's exciting, but the, I think as well that safety aspect is as well that there's it's a it's a positive 
technological curve that they're on that we're not seeing these things fall out of the sky every time they go on a test and it's it's working towards something that that could be um well could be could be really really exciting i i just keep thinking of of london and the the, the very strange nature of the way it's built up um and mm -hmm. that very <clears throat> defined ceiling as well because you've got you know especially when you're coming in on that approach in through london where you're flying up the thames which is lovely to look at right. but that's not very high then you've got london city down on the other end it's there's not a lot of room there because i know especially the helicopter operators they have to fly quite low up the river to, to get to get out of it it's it'll be yeah. interesting and but before we think of you know new york with those airports it that's, that's a that's a whole other thing i guess to to start wrapping this one up joe there is a lot to be optimistic about isn't there yeah we, 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 we spent a yeah. lot of time hearing about, you know, that you know, flying is bad and it's a terrible thing. But really, the, the space that you're working in at the moment, and so many others are as well, we, we do have, we do have a flying future, don't we? It's, it's, it's not something that we're going to see the end of anytime soon. No, absolutely. And, and I think the sustainability aspect makes that even more, uh, 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 friendly, you know, to the, to human humanity, to the world, to the earth, and, and and so forth. But I don't, I don't think. Period. Aviation is going away, ever. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's as a world, as a connected global economy and a collected culture that that we just continually move closer and closer to um, connectedness and travel, business travel, personal travel, family travel, all of that, vacationing. Like it's not going away. And we're not going back to boats. Uh, we're just we're just not. <laughs> like, don't get me wrong. I love boats. Like, I would actually love to take a worldwide trip on a boat. I think it would be amazing to go shut off for two weeks. But that's the problem is it would take two weeks. Yeah, right? exactly. And, <laughs> yeah, that's aviation is not going away. But the more we can do along everything we just talked about to make it more sustainable, to make it more green, is a step in the right direction. And you know, none of this is going to have an overnight instant change on anything. It's going to be slow incremental approaches. And the more little changes can filter into the system and can be proven safe and regulatory uh, aspects can be can be worked out and so forth like it just builds right like every one of those you get in then you have that as, as an industry um, and you can build on that and then over time these power sources we talked about will slowly get better and then new ones will be will, will emerge I, I'm 20 years from now, we'll be talking about something. I don't know if you want to call it a battery or what that we do not have today, and it'll be better. I don't know how much better, maybe only two, but maybe 100%, but who knows? But either way, either way, you move in these directions and all of this is just naturally going to evolve. So yeah, I, it's it's a fun place to be at the moment, fun industry to be in. There's a lot of change, a lot of ingenuity going on, and a lot of opportunity to do some really cool work. If you could flip a switch and get one thing that would move us forward a, a big chunk. What what would it be? Would it be the the new the newfangled fancy battery, or would it be yeah you know, hydrogen you can store on a metal plate that sort of thing? Hydrogen. Well, I mean, if, Hi if you're giving me a blank check, <laughs> I'm going to go straight for a cold fusion. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, actually, beyond that, you know, which is uh, is the the joke. It's 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 ten years away, and it always will be, yeah. right? Like yeah. <laughs> um, so near, so yet short so of that, far. Yeah. yeah, short of that, I actually don't care. I, I it, it's anything that makes this better, mm -hmm. right? It's it's a battery that's ten times better than a battery today. It's a hydrogen fuel cell that that is ten times better, and a some magical way to store hydrogen that's better. Or it's yeah, I like whether that's a tank or a, a chemical process that locks it up in something that's easy to get out and weighs nothing. And yeah, like, like say as an airplane designer, I don't care, but give me something <laughs> that is, that is sustainable and it doesn't have weight problems or volume problems. And I'd be happy. Um, but yeah. So there, ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard an airplane designer say exactly the same thing <laughs> as every airplane designer that's gone before him. <laughs> Yeah. If you think carefully, you can or listen carefully. You can hear Da Vinci saying exactly the same thing as he was. He was trying to figure <laughs> it out. Joe, this has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for spending the last little while looking into the future with us. Yeah, thank you. Big fan of your podcasts and looking forward to more. Thank you. I cannot thank Joe Welding enough for joining me on the Damcasters. 
and looking into the not too distant future of aviation with us. I'm very positive for the future of flight, but change is needed, not just in the aircraft and their operation, but in how we view and consume flight itself. Perhaps the days of the cheapy flight down to the sun on a budget airline are more numbered than aircraft themselves. Or maybe the power question, once it's solved with hydrogen, as we all know it will be, it might not change that much for us. We don't know, but the journey there is going to be very exciting, and engineers like Joe are at the forefront of where that's going to take us. So please do follow Joe on Twitter. He shares some great insights. And once his current project is out in the open, I hope he'll return and give us all the details or as many details as he's allowed to give us then. As always, thank you so much for listening. If you're able to leave the Damcasters a review on your podcast app of choice, that helps enormously, gets the pod out onto the algorithms and it goes places. The old school ways of telling your friends works a treat too. And of course you get kudos for finding the show first. And if you want to get a little bit more involved, there's a Patreon page where membership starts at just three quid a month plus a bit of that. You'll get all the latest news, the episodes as soon as I finish editing them ad free and extra posts and photos of my aviation related travels. So until the next time, thank you so much for listening. And as always, do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone. And it is a Boney Abroad podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com.